Good evening, everybody. My name is Bert Dicht. I am Vice President of Membership for the National Space Society. And on behalf of Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, I'd like to welcome you to our NSS Space Forum, Gerard K. O'Neill and the Future That Calls Us. We wanna thank you again for taking time out of your busy days to join us for these series of NSS Space Forums and also town hall meetings. Just wanted to remind you real quickly of our virtual etiquette. If you do want to submit a question, I encourage you to use the Q&A function. The Q&A function can only be seen by the panelists, but it's much easier to track the questions. If you put something in the chat, it gets mixed up with all the other comments and, and statements that people have. So use the Q&A for your questions. We're gonna to get to as many as we can. We also had quite a few that were submitted beforehand and we're gonna to try to answer those as well. Again, if you'd like to comment, use the chat function because everybody can see that. I ask you to be respectful of all the panelists and also the audience. And it's best to view the session in speaker mode, but I will also have it set up in speaker mode as well, just so, you can, just so it makes it a little easier for you to see things. Very good. And so our agenda for tonight, we're gonna to have some announcements like we typically do. I'll talk very briefly about the upcoming events. Uh, then we'll go into a very brief overview of the virtual ISDC, which is coming up. And we have some special guests for that. And finally, I will introduce our guest speaker for this evening, and then we'll close out the session. So in terms of announcements tonight, Again, I just want to remind you all, you can check out, oh, sorry about that. Looks like it advanced too fast. You can check out our NSS website, space.nss.org. And we've got a lot of new content each, you know, each week uh, on our blog. So be sure to check that out. If you are a member, be sure to go into our NSS membership portal, inside.nss.org. And we are on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So be sure to check those social media sites out. We'd love for you to give to our cause. We know you are enjoying programs like this and all donations are welcome. They help us put on great events like this. So to make a donation to support NSS, go.nss.org slash donate dash now. And I'll make sure that is in the chat as well. So you can pick up that URL. Finally, at the end of the session, please complete our post space forum survey. Only takes a few minutes. It's really, really helpful in terms of our planning for future events. It is anonymous and we really do appreciate that. In terms of what's coming up next, I did mention the ISDC. We're gonna have a very brief overview tonight. <clears throat> but on the 17th, two weeks from tonight, we're gonna to take a deeper dive of the ISDC, the virtual ISDC, and you'll get a little taste of it tonight. And also we're going to do a membership town hall. We're gonna invite several of the NSS officers, volunteer officers, and we hope to answer your questions. The virtual ISD is the following week. We are still looking at speakers and what we're gonna be doing in July. We should be able to give you an update uh, in two weeks from tonight. And then I invite you back in August where we have a speaker from the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center who's gonna be speaking about the SLS. We're working with them now to get that speaker identified. And then on the 19th, we have David Chudwin who wrote, I was a teenage space reporter. It's really amazing story that when he was in, in college, he actually went to cover the Apollo 11 launch. So you'll hear all about that. What I'd like to do now is turn it over to my two NSS <clears throat> colleagues, uh, Aggie Cobrin and Rod Pyle, who are gonna give us a brief overview of the upcoming virtual ISDC. Aggie and Rod, it's all yours. Thank you, Bert, much appreciated. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're gonna be doing and then Rod will tell you more about the speakers that will be there. But as a result of everything that's going on in the world, we are once again doing a virtual ISDC. Uh, with the hopes and actually pretty positive that next year we will be in Arlington, Virginia for our live ISTC, but we are doing a three-day 
virtual free event and then there's a single day that is a paid event and that's all going to be held june 24th to the 27th so it's later on this month and the wednesday thursday i'm sorry the thursday friday saturday are our free activities free days we're gonna have loads of speakers i think we've recorded i don't know 50 60 of them sessions so far rod um it's it's been pretty intense we've been doing a like lot more. of recording <laughs> what did you say more <laughs> it feels like more it feels like more we've been doing a lot of recording this month um rod has the pleasure of putting it all together which which we greatly appreciate but it'll be a lot of fun it's all free um, everything you see on the Thursday, Friday, Saturday is free. It's, it starts at nine o'clock in the morning Pacific time. So noon East coast time, and we'll run about five hours a day with a Q and a at the end of each day for those speakers that are on that day. And then on Sunday, there's a pay day, um, which is a little bit different. And the focus of it is a little bit different, but we are going to do four, four, four days. And then we're going to repeat again for our friends that are across the world in India and Europe. So we're going to do two showings of this, and then it'll be up after that. So it'll be a lot of fun, a lot of content, and I will let Rod tell you who some of those speakers are. So as Aggie mentioned, I've had the great pleasure of recording uh, lots and lots and lots of sessions, and it's about as good as it gets on Zoom-type technology. Um, and, and we're actually using a, a superior technology to Zoom, so you should get a really good show. Let me just mention a few of the people that we've been talking to. Uh, Isaac Arthur who many of you know has a very well attended, as in millions of views, uh, show on YouTube. Uh, Jim Green, we just talked to today. He's the chief scientist at NASA, so that makes him about, oh, number five in the pecking order there. And just an incredible, engaging, fun talk about how we found the volatiles on the moon, water, ice, and so forth, and how the Earth and the moon, which I didn't know, actually shared a primordial atmosphere billions of years ago. Didn't know that. Uh, Steve Jurbitson, the investor who uh, came riding to SpaceX's aid back in about 2008 and has been a major player in the new space arena since then. Phil Plate, the bad astronomer who I don't think needs any introduction for most of you. Peggy Whitson, a NASA shuttle astronaut who has broken just about every record that there is in terms of space flight duration. She's broken these records at one time or another, duration of space flight. I think she still holds a record for total hours of space box, space box by a woman anywhere and many, many others. She's sensational. Uh, Scott Bolton, who was the principal investigator on the Juno project to the planet Jupiter, joined us for a deep dive on that subject. Uh, Rob Manning, my friend who is the chief engineer at JPL. So when people say he's the chief engineer of what, you have to explain that he's the chief engineer of everything. And he is a wonderful and engaging and fun speaker. And finally, uh, Robert Braun, who, along with Rob Manning, designed the entry, descent, and landing sequence for the Mars rovers for the last uh, 10 to 15 years. So that's just a very small sample. There's about 40 people overall, I think, but uh, that's a small sample of who we've got. So I think from here, I'll hand it back to Bert, and I just want to say you guys are in for a real treat tonight because you're going to be listening to Emily Carney, who's an old friend and colleague and associate. Uh, I'll, I'll let... I'll let her introduce her accomplishments, but they are many. And I can say that she's one of our top contributors for Ad Astra, and she's a real joy to work with. So have a good time tonight. Thank you so much, Rod, and thank you so much, Aggie. I'm going to share my screen again real fast, and this time I'll make sure I do that. There we go. So again, everybody, we'll be taking a deeper dive into the virtual ISDC in two weeks, but be sure to check out the website and find out a lot more. And we're really looking forward to a really fun and exciting sessions in a few weeks. And it's free, as Raggy said, those first three days. And then there's the, the pay event on Sunday. So we hope you can join us. So let me now take a few minutes to uh, introduce our guest speaker for tonight. And if I could just get my slides to advance, that would be perfect. Sometimes technology holds up a little. So we have Emily Carney this evening. And as Rod said, she is an author. You have probably read a number of her articles in Ad Astra and also on our uh, uh, space, I'm sorry, NSS website uh, in blogs. She does book reviews and great articles. Uh, she also did an article for us for our liftoff, which is our uh, easy, another one of our easings. 
Uh, and of course, she's a space activist and the founder of Space Hipsters. So a lot of you are aware of that. We're really excited to have her here this evening to talk about Gerard K. O'Neill and the future that calls us. So Emily, I'm gonna turn it over to you and it is all yours. All right, well, uh, before I get started, uh, I just wanna uh, really thank the NSS for hosting me tonight. Uh, this is a huge honor and, and really a dream of mine. So thank you guys a lot. And without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen and get started with my talk. So uh, let me share my screen. Share, okay. All right, so I'm gonna get started. Okay, we're gonna get started at the end. I know that's kind of an unexpected place, but we're gonna talk about Gerard K. O'Neill. Um, Gerard K. O'Neill, he died on April 27, 1992. Um, he'd been fighting leukemia for seven years. This is noteworthy because when he was diagnosed with leukemia in 1985, he was given 18 months to live. He ended up living seven years, which is quite amazing. Um, one of his colleagues was quoted as saying he did more in seven years than most people did in their lifetime, basically. So um, he worked the entire time that he was ill. He didn't miss anything. So um, when he died, uh, obviously there was a period of mourning in the space community. Uh, a few years later, his ashes were launched on a, one of the first uh, Celestis flights. I believe using a um, like a orbital ATK rocket, a Taurus rocket. Um, but really, after his ashes were launched, we didn't hear a lot about him. Uh, he sort of faded into obscurity. Now, um, why did this happen? Uh, why isn't he as well remembered as say like Carl Sagan, uh, somebody whose fame was really uh, kind of equal to his during you know the 1970s? Uh, so tonight we're going to talk about Gerard K. O'Neill. Who was he? Uh, why is he still relevant? And what was his what is what was his life and career? And what is his legacy now? So we're going to talk about that. And here's a photo. The photo you're looking at is of Jerry, circa mid 1980s, with his three books. And we're going to talk about those books tonight a little bit. All right. Here is young Jerry. He's about 10 years old here. Uh, Jerry O'Neill, Gerard K. O'Neill, who was born, Gerard Kitchen O'Neill, Kitchen was his mother's name, is her maiden name, uh, was born on February 6, 1927 in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he had a pretty uh, upper middle class childhood. His father was a lawyer. Uh, they had a pretty uh, prosperous life. Um, and young Jerry really enjoyed things like, uh, he liked building train sets. He really liked sort of building things with his hands, which, um, is kind of a theme that you'll see throughout his life. He really, uh, enjoyed sort of putting things together. And as we'll see through the talk, he eventually, um, went on to build some pretty big things in his, in his careers. So this is sort of a, a theme throughout his entire life that he developed during his childhood. <clears throat> So we're going to skip a few years, but um, Jerry ended up like many young men when he became a teen, when he graduated from high school and became a, a young man. He graduated from high school when he was 17. Back then, you could do a lot of semesters early. So he graduated kind of early from high school. Um, like many young men at his of his era, he joined the military. Uh, during that time, World War II was happening. Uh, millions, probably millions of thousands, millions, I don't know, a lot of people were joining the military during that time. So he joined the Navy uh, when he was 17. Here's a picture of him around that time. Uh, as you can see, he looked like he was 15. He looked really young. So um, during that time, Jerry went to a really, he was, um, his, uh, I believe his rate in the Navy was a, a radio man. And he went to a very uh, challenging school in the Navy at the time. It was probably one of the most challenging schools at that time in the Navy. Uh, it was basically like a radar tech school. 
Um, because of this, he had to do a lot of remedial math. This is kind of hard to believe, but he wasn't always really good at math, so he had to do some catch-up work. Um, so this whole experience really would sort of uh, add to his interest in the scientific fields uh, for the rest of his life and would deeply influence his decisions to really go into that field after he got out of the military. So he was in the Navy for two years. He did, a, I believe he served on like a medium class ship. Um, he wasn't in any ma real major combat and he did, obviously he survived the war. So, um, so he did two years and he uh, ended up getting out of the Navy and went to uh, Swarthmore College uh, on the GI Bill. So we're gonna fast forward a little bit through time. Okay, this is Jerry around the mid 1950s. Um, after he graduated from Swarthmore, he got married, uh, which was kind of a societal ex uh, expectation of most young men his age back then. He got married, uh, he started a family and he started a PhD, I believe at Cornell. And uh, when he got out of Cornell, he ended up uh, getting a job as a, a, I think, an associate professor at a Princeton University. And his field was high energy particle physics, which back then um, really was a new, brand new field. No, it was it was brand new. Not much was really known about it. So for him, it was really just exciting, um, and and you know something he really wanted to do. Uh, around the same time during the mid 50s, um, he started developing something called a particle storage ring. Uh, this, um, this invention back then was kind of uh, viewed as crazy. It took him a really long time to develop this and to get this up and running. Um, and be because of that, he spent a ton of time away from home. He, he flew uh, from the United States to Europe a lot uh, to develop this uh this invention that he came up with. So it really, um, like I said, it really kept him away from home, away from his family a lot. Um, so he sort of ended up developing issues with his marriage because he wasn't home. So um, yeah, so his, uh, his career as a physicist was growing, but you know, sort of at a price by this point. All right, here is Jerry around the mid 1960s. We've gone a little bit uh, further in time. Uh, he would probably be around 40 in this picture. And, um, and by the way, a lot of these photos are from the High Frontier, the movie. Uh, many of you have probably seen it, their website. Uh, there's some great photos of him on their Facebook, their Instagram, uh, and their website that I'd never seen before of him when he was younger, which are really cool. So if you wanna go look at that, I highly recommend it. So here's Jerry around mid 1960s. Um, around this time, uh, the particle storage ring was really showing potential as an industry standard. And it would, it, eventually it was recognized as um, a really awesome invention. Uh, however, um, he did not really get the recognition he deserved for this invention. And um, he was kind of disillusioned. And, uh, and also his marriage was really falling apart by this point. So the mid 1960s was kind of a time of reckoning. Uh, he wanted some things different in his life. Um, around this time, he got a divorce. Um, and not only did he move on from his marriage, but he was interested in moving on professionally. He would try out for the 1967 astronaut class. He was, he was prepared to leave everything he'd done at Princeton to join the astronaut class. <clears throat> so around... <laughs> excuse me, so around 1966 and 1960, early 67, he went through the process basically to become an astronaut. He went through all the medical tests, all the psychological tests, um, and he actually made it as a finalist in the 1967 astronaut class. All right, here is the 1967 astronaut class. Uh, unfortunately, as you could probably see, O'Neill is not part of it. Uh, he, he did come very close. He was a finalist for this class. He, um, he almost made it. So um, here is the 1967 astronaut class. Even though he did not make it to the class, he made some pretty good friendships with some people who also tried out with him and actually did make it to the class. And we'll talk a little bit 
about those friendships now. Um, and you guys might be able to see there's some pretty famous, uh, I'm waving my cursor around. You, there's some pretty famous uh, faces in here. Here's a uh, story Musgrave. Some of you might know who he is. Uh, this is Joe Allen. And we're going to talk a little bit about a couple more people in here. So during these tryouts, um, O'Neill met an astro or somebody who would become an astronaut, uh, an astronomer named Brian O'Leary. Um, this is notable because O'Leary and uh, O'Neill would work together a lot in the next decade. Um, um, O'Leary, like I said, was an astronomer and they would co-write a lot of papers together. And um, O'Leary was one of the first people actually really, who really took O'Neill's treatises about space settlement really seriously. So um, th that is definitely worth mentioning. And we're gonna talk a little more about O'Leary in the next few slides. Another person he met during this time uh, is Phil Chapman. Uh, Phil uh, Chapman died recently, he died in April. And um, he uh, also was, I think, uh, okay, I think I hit something accidentally, but we're all good. <laughs> uh, Phil Chapman also uh, met O'Neill around this time. And um, Phil was also somebody who was kind of a futurist, uh, really believed that humans, the human destiny was Lied, uh, was laying in space. Um, and he and uh, O'Neill would also work together uh, in the next decade. Uh, um, Chapman was a really big uh, proponent of uh, space-based solar power. He worked with Dr. Peter Glazer during the 1970s. And um, I have another picture of Chapman. And um, Chapman also would eventually become the president of the L5 Society, um, which many of you know what it is. Ooh. Sorry, something fell in my house, uh, which many of you know what it is. We're going to talk a little bit about the forming of the L5 Society in a few minutes. So uh, here's a picture of Chapman inside a, a lunar module uh, trainer in 1968. Uh, many of you might ask, well, what happened to Chapman and O'Leary? What Which flights did they fly to space? Um, unfortunately, both of them it would end up resigning from NASA uh, for similar reasons. Uh, they both were kind of dismayed by the lack of uh, scientific opportunities at NASA at that time. And um, another thing was, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the, I'll look at that later. Um, another thing that uh, O'Leary didn't want to fly planes. He, he actually uh, said, I guess, flying is not my cup of tea. So um, yeah, that sort of impacted his career. So, but we'll talk a little bit more about O'Leary in the next few slides. So um, by this point, O'Neill is still at Princeton. Um, and by 1969, um, he was looking for something to excite his students. Um, it was around the time of the moon landing. Apollo was really in full swing. It was very exciting. I mean, O'Neill was really looking for something to sort of excite his students about like uh, the physics, basically. Um, a big problem that O'Neill thought was going to happen in the field was he was worried that students would sort of lose interest in physics and in, in the science, uh, sciences because um, at that time there were a lot of social problems in the United States um, and a lot of students were sort of like well how can I tackle social issues and you know be interested in the sciences at the same time. So O'Neill was sort of looking for, uh, as he would, th this was the kind of person he was, he was looking for solutions to sort of solve this issue and to keep his students interested. And one thing he came up with was the idea of um, maybe students sort of inventing their own off-world space communities. And um, this is the birth of his famous question that he asked to his, that is, uh, he asked, which is, and many of you have probably memorized this, is a planetary surface the right place for an expanding industrial or technological civilization? So um, his students uh, doing their work were basically like, well, no, we don't think so. So this really spurred O'Neill into thinking about, seriously thinking about settlements in space and how we would tackle so, some of the problems on earth, such as uh, pollution, overpopulation, uh, lack of resources, um, this really got him thinking, well, we could seriously tackle some of these issues, um, perhaps by, you know, um, devising 
practical space settlements. And um, so it was something that he really thought about in um, 1969. Um, the reason why I had this picture up, and some of you might notice this, uh, there's this sort of pyramid he has in his hands with pencils or pens. Uh, he's not doing a gang sign or anything weird like that. It's not some weird Illuminati thing. Um, this is actually a thing he used to do. He used to put some pens together and ask somebody, okay, make a like a pyramid or a triangle from it. And the person would do it or try to do it. And it was basically O'Neill's way of saying, please always look at the uh, unrecognized dimension. It was sort of a thing he would do to have people look at that third or fourth, you know, layer of complexity in there. So um, I'm just using this to sort of illustrate the kind of thinking that he in, was engaging in. All right. So O'Neill writes this article called The Colonization of Space, and um, he sends it to a bunch of scientific journals, and they all reject it. Uh, at that time, that idea was seen as very fanciful. Um, it also really impacted his regular career at Princeton. Um, scientists like him did not write pieces like that at the time. Um, he was writing something that some people saw as borderline science fiction, and um, for the Nobel Committee, the Nobel Prize Committee, which he should have been seriously considered for, they viewed that as sort of anathema. So um, yeah, so during this time, he was very professionally sort of disillusioned. Um, his ideas about space settlements really had no backers. So around 1972, um, O'Neill went on vacation to see his children in New England, and he ran into uh, Brian O'Leary again. Um, Brian O'Leary by this point had quit NASA. He was teaching at Hampshire College. Uh, he was an astronomy professor and he had written a book in 1970 called The Making of an, an Ex-Astronaut. And here's the blurb or the, the New York Times uh, advertisement for it about sort of his disillusionment with the astronaut corps. So um, by this point, O'Neill is like, you know, I can't get a break. Uh, nobody wants to hear about my ideas about, you know, um, uh, space settlement or anything like that you know I just don't know what to do and O'Leary was like well I'll let you speak about it at my college how about that and um, O'Neill was like okay so O'Leary uh, arranged a lecture for him and about 200 people or so showed up and um, O'Leary was really the first person ever who had um, who had a, a lecture about um, space settlement at a college like that. And he was in, he kind of gave that opportunity to O'Neill. So O'Neill was really pretty grateful for him for doing that. So, all right. After this point, that was sort of a breaking point for O'Neill in a very positive way. Uh, by this point, O'Neill uh, started to do lectures about space settlement and he really started to develop a bit of a following. Um, we're going to flash forward a bit to 1974. Uh, his article called The Colonization of Space that had been rejected for the previous five years finally got accepted at um, Physics Today. Um, that article, if you want to read it, it is kind of math and physics heavy, is still available at the NSS website. Um, and yeah, it finally got published after five years of rejections. And um, another thing that happened that year, later that year, was uh, he was interviewed by the New York Times. And that article ended up being on the front page of the New York Times, which he really was not expecting. So at this point, he kind of became a media celebrity. Uh, him and his wife, Tasha, he had remarried. Um, they had to delist their phone number. And um, yeah, by this point, he started to achieve that type of celebrity that someone like Carl Sagan had during that time. and. Uh, Here's a picture of him lecturing, and I, I think this is from 1981 at Cincinnati College. So, all right, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of his ideas. Uh, here, here's one. He all around the same time he came up with the idea, and this was also aided by uh, people such as O'Leary. Uh, he also came up with the idea for a lunar mass driver around this time. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Uh, here is a pretty simplified diagram of the lunar mass driver. And if you've seen the High Frontier movie that's out, it's out, on, I think, on uh, Google Play. 
I think it's out on uh, Apple TV or Apple if you want to buy it. Um, there's actually some really pretty high resolution uh, remastered um, demonstrations of the mass driver. Uh, basically, it would be a, a for it would sort of be almost like a, a maglev almost to uh, launch lunar material off the surface to another destination. And this would be sort of a, a you know, a, a catalyst to build actually space settlement. So this was something that he was seriously coming up with around this time. All right. Like I said, around this time, O'Neill was becoming a serious media darling. Um, his ideas were really becoming mainstream famous. Uh, he did a ton of interviews in magazines uh, from, uh, I think, the New York Times Magazine to uh, uh, Penthouse uh, at the time. Uh, he, he did interviews with Omni, uh, a lot of the famous magazines of the 70s. Uh, he also... Uh, did the Johnny Carson show because Johnny was a uh, huge fan of space flight. So here's him with Johnny Carson in 1977. Uh, he was also on shows such as 60 Minutes and the PB PBS's Nova. So he really was becoming famous almost at the same level as, like I said, again, Carl, I keep bringing up Carl Sagan because those of you remember Carl Sagan was on Johnny Carson quite a bit. So he was kind of developing the same level of fame as somebody like that would back then. Um, so a few things also happened around this time, um, I, and I've kind of skipped them, but I'm going to try to summarize them as best as I can right now. Um, in, uh, at NASA Ames in 1975-76 and 77, uh, there were several summer studies to help um, sort of, sort of um, better envision uh, the, uh, his ideas of space settlements. And O'Leary, I believe, was involved in the 1976 one quite extensively. That's the one where they uh, discussed the lunar mass driver quite a bit. But, um, and also around that time in 1975, um, the L5 Society was formed by Carolyn Meinl and Keith Henson. And um, like I said, Phil Chapman would eventually become president for a while of uh, the L5 Society. And uh, this is very important because the L5 Society and I could do a whole talk on the L5 Society by itself because uh, it was one of the first space flight advocacy groups that I can think of. And um, its heritage contributes greatly to the National Space Society. Uh, the L5 Society integrated with the National Space Institute in 1987 and became the National Space Society. So that's a big reason um, part of its heritage is our heritage too at the NSS. Um, there's a lot of people who were in the L5 Society in the NSS uh, to this day, um, and uh, the L5 Society had an incredible magazine called the L5 News. I still have a lot of copies of it that uh, friends have given me, and it had incredible art. This was really the first time we were seeing the intersection of uh, space flight and space art, and um, L5 News had uh, paintings and pictures in it by people such as Don Davis, uh, Kim Poor, Rick Sternbach, uh, you name it. They were all the big artists were in there. So um, the reason why I'm mentioning the L5 News is because you can see a lot of echoes of it in uh, today in Ad Astra, which is, of course, our flagship magazine at the National Space Society. All right. Now we're gonna show some pretty pictures of what you guys have been waiting for, the actual uh, space settlements. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the book, The High Frontier, which was uh, released in 19, early 1977 and is viewed as uh, one of the great uh, classic space settlement books of all time, probably the great space uh, settlement classic book of all time. Um, the High Frontier uh, is at the same time it's readable but it really does present a persuasive case uh, for space settlements. Uh, O'Neill tried to make it uh, appealing to all sorts of audiences. Uh, you know, he tried to make it appealing to the eggheads who are really into the, you know, the science. And he tried to make it appealing to regular people, probably like me, <laughs> who, you know, just, you know, were fascinated with the idea of reading about, you know, living in space. So um, born from the studies at NASA Ames, uh, held in concert with Stanford University. Um, the High Frontier 
presented three distinct refined habitat designs, which included uh, Island One, which is a modified Bernal sphere, <clears throat> uh, Island Two, which is the Stanford Taurus, uh, capable of harging, uh, I'm sorry, housing large uh, numbers of people. And it almost kind of represents uh, the Von Braun space station, which is the large ring space station that you all have may have seen. And um, he also talked about Island Three, which is a two cylinder habitat design. <clears throat> and um, it really makes the book, The High Frontier, really makes a persuasive case for life beyond Earth or any other planet. Um, it's really interspersed with stories describing a future in space habitats, along with the uh, vivid descriptions of habitats themselves. Um, and one version of the book uh, featured illustrations by Don Davis, a pretty famous space artist. Um, and this was a watershed moment in the intersection of spaceflight literature and art. So um, we're gonna look at some pretty pictures for a few minutes. Uh, here's a, a, a Bernal sphere, which would be more in line with Island One. Okay, and here is a, uh, I don't know if I'm saying his name, uh, by uh, Rick Judice. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. I'm sorry. I've only read it. Um, here's a top view of a, of a space colony or a space settlement. And um, as you can see here, <clears throat> these space settlements didn't look like spaceships. Uh, many spacecraft in the 1970s, when we think of spacecraft in the 1970s, what do, what do we think of? We think of Apollo, uh, the Apollo command module, which was pretty little not a lot of space. Um, we think of Skylab, which was a space station, uh, which was, you know, pretty big inside, but it didn't have lush vegetation. It didn't have the sun rising over it. Um, O'Neill was really interested in having settlements that looked a lot like Earth because he was aware that, you know, beautiful surroundings are really important for, you know, sort of your mental health. <clears throat> so he really wanted to have surroundings that look sort of earth-like and that were very welcoming. All right, um, here's one by uh, Don Davis. And um, this is actually based on the idea of, um, you can see there's a, I'm gonna take my cursor here. There's a bridge here. This was actually based on a, um, an idea that uh, O'Neill gave Davis about, make it sort of look like the Golden Gate Bridge. Make it sort of look like that. So, um, and that's what Davis did. So as you can see, this is sort of viewing um, sort of an end cap of an O'Neill cylinder and it looks very earth-like except for the, the, um, the sun and the, you know, you can see the sides of the cylinder. So really cool. All right, here is an interior and I believe this is also by Don Davis. This is the interior of the Stanford Taurus. Um, looks a lot like a nice hotel. So it's kind of like a Hilton. So very uh, appealing, very, you know, a place that you want to be. All right. And here is more, I think, of uh, Island 3, which is sort of a two-cylinder design. Um, and uh, here we go. Yep. And you can see the, you know, there would be people and infrastructure inside of here. So, and that's the end of my pretty pictures for the evening. Actually, it's not, just kidding. All right, here is um, one of my favorite paintings ever. And I think this is the first painting that Don Davis ever did of a space settlement. And um, it's kind of, it's an, as you can see above, there's an eclipse. It's sort of half in day, half in light. And um, there's kind of weird red lighting in here, but I just think this is exquisite. This is probably one of the best paintings of a, of a space settlement that I've ever seen. So really beautiful. All right. Now, the reason why I'm showing this picture of O'Neill accepting what looks like a check is because around 1977, um, O'Neill really became aware that um, you know, he'd done these three studies with NASA uh, in 75, 76, and 77. And he was kind of aware that, you know, while NASA is awesome, um, it is really subject to the whims of political, you know, political um, administrations. And by that point, you know, uh, they'd gone from Ford to Carter. 
you know, uh, NASA was sort of facing, you know, sort of new challenges because of that. So O'Neill was interested in funding his ideas um, a, in a way that would, where he wouldn't really need NASA. So in 1977, he and his uh, wife, Tasha, they founded the Space Settlement uh, SSI, the Space, uh, Space Studies Institute, I'm sorry. And uh, the SSI is still around to this day. You can actually donate to it. Um, they have incredible archives. If you go online, um, their website is pretty awesome. It has some pretty good uh, information about O'Neill and his life and his career and sort of the history of SSI. But um, yeah, that was basically created so, you know, O'Neill and people like him could sort of fund those, you know, at least looking into those ideas without really depending on NASA or anybody else. So they could kind of do it themselves. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about O'Neill entering the 1980s. Um, this is O'Neill at the cockpit of a, a space shuttle simulator. Uh, O'Neill was a pilot, and um, O'Neill's uh, uh, expertise as a pilot would inform actually his next uh, big decision and his next invention. Um, so by 1980, 81, um, O'Neill sort of sensed a downturn in interest in his ideas about space settlement. Um, around this time, uh, there was a new president in town. There was Ronald Reagan. Um, the space shuttle was fly was starting to fly. Um, even though the even though the space shuttle was flying, um, there was still sort of this uncertainty. You know, will the space shuttle actually be this reusable space truck of the future as we envisioned it? And um, as we know now, it. it it had issues during its time, but it was sort of a time of a transition in O'Neill's career again. But he was actually well prepared to handle that time. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So um, in 1981, actually 40 years ago last month, he uh, published his second book, 2081, A Hopeful View of the Human Future. Um, it's actually, this book is wonderful. I think everybody should read it. Um, it's got some amazing, um, it, it discusses amazing technology, not just space settlements, but he predicts a lot of technology that we actually have nowadays, such as, for example, Kindle. You know, he predicted that we would be able to access books via a small handheld computer, things like that. Um, it's really amazingly futuristic looking back at it, but when it was released, it was not really regarded as the same kind of classic as a high frontier as the high frontier was. Uh, it was actually kind of seen as a little far out for its time. But uh, I think this is a wonderful book. And I think to really get to know O'Neill and what his entire thing was, you really need to read it. Oh, I went. Okay, so. In uh, 1981, by this point, O'Neill, like I said, was starting to see sort of a downturn in uh, the popularity of his ideas. Um, it was, like I said, it was a different time politically by that point, Reagan was president. Um, and he was sort of interested in becoming, O'Neill saw this and he was, so he decided to enter phase three of his career. He decided to go in a, a kind of entrepreneurship and um, the a few years prior, there had been a terrible accident in over San Diego. Uh, there had been a plane collision. Uh, two planes were flying, and they collided into each other on a perfectly sunny day. And uh, O'Neill was a pilot, and he saw this. And um, being the kind of thinker he was, he was like, there's got to be some technology we can put in place to have sort of collision warning and to prevent these kind of accidents from happening, because this shouldn't have happened. So O'Neill invented something that would eventually become called Geostar. Um, at the time, it was called the Radio Determination uh, Satellite Service, RDSS, but it would be called Geostar. And uh, here's sort of a diagram of what Geostar looked like. It was a geolocating service for aircraft. And he also envisioned that for um, other things as well, such as vehicles. Um, at the time, this was very um, ahead of its time. Many of you are probably looking at this thinking, well, that's a lot like the GPS I have in my phone. That's because it is like the GPS you have in your phone. It's a geolocating service. Um, the idea for it is that if your plane 
or let's say, you know, your plane is lost, you know, you don't know where you are, you can find where you're at. Another um, idea was, let's say you're in your truck or your car and your car breaks down and you need um, help to find you so you can get your car fixed. Um, it would help with that as well. So he was really ahead of his time in uh, looking at this. And um, he, uh, so he actually, uh, in, uh, he came up with this company and um, I want to say a couple of geo, two or one or two or three, I think, uh, Geostar satellites were actually launched during the 1980s. Um, but unfortunately, uh, O'Neill would become really sick and uh, wouldn't re really be able to uh, enjoy his success. And unfortunately, with his illness, Geostar would actually start to falter as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about that now. So in 1985, after a routine physical for a surgery, O'Neill found out he had a chronic lymphocytic leukemia, um, and he uh, he was given 18 months to live, and um, didn't really want to accept it. He did undergo some experimental treatments, and he ended up living for another uh, seven years, as I mentioned previously in my talk. Um, unfortunately, Geostar did run into a lot of business problems around that time, and I, it did go into bankruptcy around uh, 1991, and its assets had to be sold to, uh, I think, Motorola, Ugh, can't say it, Motorola around that time. So um, by the time of his death, he was also trying to work on a sort of maglev train as well. So he was really busy up to the time of his death. He was... Uh, by this point, he'd retired from Princeton, but he was still a, a professor emeritus at Princeton. Uh, he was still very busy uh, with the SSI, and he was still busy uh, with his sort of entrepreneurship that was going on. So he really tried to stay busy throughout uh, seven years, and he got quite a bit accomplished. Um, and uh, he also did a book around this time called The Technology Edge, which was really touches more on his entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, exploits around this time. So all right. So we're going to talk a little bit about his legacy. Um, as I said earlier, he died in April 1992. And um, when he died, he did sort of fade into obscurity, unfortunately. Uh, why is this? Why do I think this happened? Um, I think he, my personal feelings is he was sort of a different personality than a lot of the science communicators of his time. He was kind of humble. He wasn't very outspoken as much. If you hear him speak, um, there are several recordings of him speaking on the SSI SoundCloud channel. There's also um, some YouTube clips of him speaking. And if you watch the High Frontier movie, there's a lot of clips of him speaking in it. He was kind of um, soft-spoken, very modest. Um, I think that's part of the reason why he sort of faded in, into obscurity. You know, he didn't really seek fame quite as much. Um, and also, I think, you know, sort of the passing of time sort of, um, you know, sort of, I guess, diminished his fame. You know, I think the idea of space settlement is looked at, was looked at as something as, well, that's something from the 70s. You know, that's, that's something from back then. As we can see now, that's not something from back then. Uh, we, he left a huge legacy and really the dream of, uh, of commercial space and space settlement is starting to happen now. Uh, we've seen it with SpaceX. Uh, we're seeing it with the Blue Origin, uh, even though uh, Bezos and Musk have very different feelings about um, uh, space settlement. Um, Bezos is more, um, has more of an O'Neill vision whereas Musk has more of a Mars vision, um, they're both very on board with those types of ideas. Um, also, uh, many of us have seen in the last year, we've got a lot of civilians, not you know, non-NASA astronauts. We got a lot of civilian astronauts going to space soon. Uh, just today, it was announced that uh, Kelly Girardi is uh, going up as a payload specialist on a Virgin Galactic flight. Um, these are things that uh, probably wouldn't have been possible uh, 10 years ago, we're starting to see uh, regular people that I want to emphasize very capable regular people um, get the capability to go to space, which is something that O'Neill really envisioned. 
So his legacy is definitely alive. Um, as far as space settlement is concerned, um, there are people out there such as uh, Al Globus uh, who are still keeping the dream alive. They're uh, working on their ideas of space settlement that are a little different from O'Neill's ideas, but are still very relevant and actually quite doable. So um, O'Neill has actually uh, also himself, he's actually enjoyed a kind of renaissance lately. Uh, the High Frontier movie uh, was just released a couple of months ago. Uh, like I said, it's available on Apple, uh, on Apple. It's available on Google Play and several other uh, sources as well. And um, you all, I'm a little biased because uh, I love this movie, but you all should see it. Uh, it's, they did a fantastic job on it. And also, let me stop sharing my screen. All right. Also, um, you guys might want to get this in the last, uh, this might be backwards, in the last uh, couple months, this new book came out. It's called Humanizing Space. It's by Dylan Taylor with uh, John DeSimone. I think I'm saying his name right. Uh, this is really the full, full first full biography uh, that's been out about O'Neill. And um, there were, th I've been researching O'Neill for a few years and there were things that I didn't know in here. So if you're interested in his life and career, uh, you really need to read this book. So um, yeah, so lately his life and career has kind of undergone a, a resurgence in uh, popularity. And uh, I got to give myself a little shout out. I did write an article about him in our latest at Astra and it's called the Gerard K. O'Neill, A Heroic Life. So um, yeah, so his legacy and his spirit is very much still alive in this community. And um, I really hope that's what you guys get from it, is that um, a lot of his ideas and a lot of the sort of seeds he planted, no matter how small they are, are, are really uh, coming to life now. So, which is exciting. I, I think, you know, I think we're living in a very exciting time and heck, I'm hoping that maybe I'll get a, I'll get a ride to space one of these days. You never know. So, all right, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emily. That was fabulous. We learned a lot. What we'd like to do now is make a transition and answer some questions. Uh, we can start with some that came in uh, from our uh, audience. And you said you've been studying O'Neill for a while. What got you interested in, in O'Neill to begin with? That's a wonderful question. Um, the Okay. I kind of, and I'm embarrassed to admit this because a lot of you in this um, in this uh, uh, event have known about O'Neill probably for over 40 years. Um, I'm actually really embarrassed to admit this. I was reading about Brian O'Leary because a few years ago I uh, started a series of blogs about Brian O'Leary's career, and we talked about him. I talked about him a little bit during this talk. He's really a subject onto himself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was reading about him and I was reading um, his book, The Making of an Ex-Astronaut, and it mentioned Gerard K. O'Neill. And I was like, I've heard that guy's name before because he's like, yeah, I, I tested with Gerard K. O'Neill from Princeton. I was like, that guy's name is real. Like he did something, right? <laughs> so I uh, looked him, I f and I feel dumb admitting this because I honestly, I'd never, I hadn't read The High Frontier by that point. So I looked him up and I was like, he tried out for the, and I read this guy's list of like accolades, you know, and, and I was like, he didn't make it as an astronaut. Like what, who were they choosing as astronauts back in the sixties, you know? So I was just very intrigued. And um, so I got the high frontier and I, I'm embarrassed. I'd never read it. And I got the high frontier and I just fell in love when I read that book. Um, I, I just think it's a, he's, a, I, I think O'Neill is just a masterful I fell in love with the writing. I think his writing was, re re he's just a really amazing writer. Um, I'm a little jealous that he can be a physicist and be an incredible writer at the same time. Um, those things aren't always mutually exclusive. Um, I just loved how that book, that book is really sort of for me, like as a science communicator, like like sort of like a cosmos type book. Like it's a gold standard because it um, it's very appealing if you're into like the math and the physics and all that. It, it you you'll really enjoy it but if you're just a regular person you can also enjoy it as well like it's written for all audiences it's not just written for one type of person so that's what I really loved about it and then I really started uh, 
sort of researching his life and career and um I was really just amazed at like especially in his last few years when he was really sick he just didn't quit he just he just kept on doing stuff and I was like man like I want a career like that guy like he just doesn't stop you know and um so yeah I just it's sort of a combination of just like you know I sort of stumbled upon him and I, I should have stumbled upon him years earlier and I'm embarrassed I, I didn't but it was sort of a, you know, I stumbled upon him and and there, I really admire him like as a person. Like he seems, this is somebody who, you know, faced a lot of roadblocks and just wouldn't quit, you know? So I I really admire that about him. That So I hope that answers the question. That's a that's a great answer. And I, I actually uh, dug up my copy of the, yeah. the High Frontier. Uh, I was actually going to go back and read it. I, I read it when I was in college. So, <laughs> but yeah, here's you, mine. You just read it. How do you think it holds up uh, today after everything we're doing today in terms of, te of space settlement technology? I think it holds up remarkably well. Um, I do think there are people in the space settlement community now um, such as I want to say Al Globus. I'm a, I'm a little familiar with his work. He I might be in the talk tonight. I'm not sure. Um, in the audience. I'm a little. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm a little familiar with his work, but um, I, he's um, he's written sort of about space settlements that are a little different from O'Neill's, but are really doable. They're they're a little smaller because O'Neill's settlements were. If you read the High Frontier, his his vision was very big. Um, his settlements have about ten thousand. Or so people in them they're they're quite large they're about the size of a small city and um i think um there are other people out there who are like well you can make them smaller and they can they don't have to be at the l5 lagrangian point that's something i'm embarrassed i didn't mention this during my talk um that's another thing is o'neill um the reason why the l5 society was the l5 society is because he proposed that the settlements be at the l5 libation point um, because it was, you know, and I think O'Neill's explanation was, it's a place to put it. You can put it at L1, L, you know, you can put it at any of the L, uh, libation points. But I think that for him was just sort of a, a stable, like a reference point. But um, I think people now, such as Al Globus, um, I think their thing is, well, you don't have to put it at L5. So, um, yeah. And even though it's not the same vision that, like, um, even though it's not the same vision as uh, O'Neill, I mean, I think we can see a lot of sort of the seeds that O'Neill um, planted um, in things that are happening now, such as, like I said, during my, at the end of my talk, like um, we're seeing like commercial astronauts go to space. I think it was O'Neill's dream that regular people get a chance to go to space, not, not you know, NASA astronauts are awesome, but you know, I think his dream was, you know, we want to see, you know, regular human beings go to space. And we're, we're starting to see that now, you know, I mean, like I said, we have, um, I have a few friends, it's unbelievable. I have a few friends of mine who are going to space this year, apparently. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, it's just, it's just crazy to me, you know, and I mean, and they're just regular, they're regular cool people, but they're, they're going to be astronauts. And I think that's, um, and granted, there's not a lot of them, but it's just, I think it's starting to trickle out that, okay, this is something that can be doable. Very true, very true. I, I, I speak to a, a lot of students uh, in, my, in my job, and they're, they're always asking about becoming an astronaut, and I point out to them that their path for them could be a lot different, that they're not going to have to be professional astronauts for NASA, which is exceedingly hard. Based on the last class, I think 18,000 applied and 12 were accepted. Yeah. And you might become an engineer or a researcher and your company will buy a seat on SpaceX or exactly or Shepard to take you to space. Yes. Exactly. And um, I think the shuttle program, uh, and I, 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 I think the shuttle program did sort of also plant the seeds of that because we did see civilians become astronauts on shuttle as well i do want to mention that because there were a few people like charlie walker who weren't nasa astronauts but he still flew on the space shuttle so yeah and I, i'm seeing the notes i said libation point i'm a little um i'm a little nervous so i'm sorry i meant libration point 
So I apologize, but uh, yeah, I was a little yeah, nervous. So I, audience. <laughs> I may have stumbled upon my words a bit, so I do apologize. I, I'm a little, I was a little nervous once I saw the uh, over a hundred people. So I was like, uh, so. But they're all friendly. Very good. Uh, okay. I just wanted to point out too, I've got my copy of uh, The Making of an Ex-Astronaut as well. So. <laughs> I love that book. Yeah, and, that's. Uh, and not everybody I'm, likes I'm it. Yeah, I'm going to pitch NSS because I got a chance to meet Brian O'Leary at the very first ISDC wow. in in LA in 1982. I actually sat at his table for with for lunch. What? So That is awesome. <laughs> so, so that's what NSS can do for you. I was a I was a 20 some year old young engineer working for Northrop in LA and oh wow, Brian O'Leary is going to be there and uh, Wow. So that also, but that point, I also knew about Ger, you know, Gerard O'Neill too. So it's a nice circle that we it brings together. <laughs> yeah, it's but, funny because Brian O'Leary is the one who got me interested in Gerard K. O'Neill, and, I, and it's embarrassing that I didn't. I honestly did not know much about O'Neill until I read about, um, until I read the making of an ex astronaut, and I was like, who? I've heard that guy, you know. And then I kind of did some <laughs> digging. So yeah, absolutely. I know we've got a few questions that have come in. I just want to ask you a couple things about your writing first before we, we address some of the questions that have come in. But, you know, there's so many things to cover when it comes to space these days. And as you just even mentioned, you know, the, you know, the space 2.0 and the space entrepreneurs versus what NASA is doing and what's happening in China and India and, and so on. So what, how do you choose what to write about? How do I choose what to write about? Um, well, I have a blog. I obviously have the blog on the National Space Society. Um, and I also have a, um, I have a podcast that has nothing to do with the National Space Society, but it's called Space and Things. Um, and I have a co-host, Dave Giles, who's in the UK. And um, it's really cool. I feel like I get to, between those two vehicles, I feel like I get to sort of live out all my space subject matter dreams because um, I really, I'm kind of a loser. I really love like um, the, the whole period of space flight in the 1970s between the Apollo lunar missions and before the shuttle because everybody seems to have this attitude like, well, once the lunar mission stopped, everything shut down for about 10 years. And I'm like, that's not really true. <laughs> there actually was a lot that happened in space flight in the 70s. Um, as far as uh, advancing technology was concerned that we probably don't hear a lot about now. Like, um, so I've started a new series on the NSS called Space in the 70s. And um, the first post was about um, something that some people might think is boring, but I, I just was like, why don't people know about this? <laughs> you know, why isn't this something taught about, you know, or more, I guess, more mainstream? So um, I'm sort of writing about that just because as a space historian, I feel like that whole era is just neglected. Like it's, you know, and I, I love the Apollo lunar missions. Don't get me wrong. They're incredible. Uh, but there's just not a lot of writing about that sort of middle period. So I'm sort of hoping, hoping to fill the void. Uh, with space and things, we talk about every topic. Uh, we talk about uh, space diplomacy. Uh, we talk about everything that's happening all over the world. And we also have uh, a lot of uh, interesting guests as well. Um, I think this week we sort of did a travel log episode of if you go to Kennedy Space Center, what do you have to see there? Um, so space and things really is sort of a mixed bag. And we talk about everything. Uh, we talk about launches all over the world. Um, we talk about, um, yeah, pretty much every dang thing out there. So that's sort of a a mixed bag. <laughs> Very good. One of the questions you've asked, you answered in a way already that came in was uh, one, people wanted to know your opinion of the, the movie, The High Frontier. You said you loved it, but anything else to add? It's really, um, it, it, I do have to say, I, I think everybody needs to watch it because uh, I, I, I was born in 1978 and I, I, I really, um, other than stuff I've researched about him, I really didn't know anything about him, which is, you know, and um, which probably owes to my age, but um, it's kind of embarrassing, you know, I, and I felt like this guy is such a, a visionary and really such a pioneer. And I'm like, why didn't I know anything about him, you know? And I think that's uh, the movie really shows who he was, 
you know, um, I think people, you know, sort of see his name and think, oh, that's the space settlement guy. But the movie really introduces you, you to who he is as a person. And another thing that I think is um, interesting about the film is it really pays tribute to somebody who has kind of been forgotten, unfortunately. I think criminally under criminally underrated because um, in his science career as a physicist, he didn't really get a lot of credit for what he did. Um, he should have probably won a Nobel Prize or something like that, but because he did, you know, sort of this, this, the science community viewed his work in space settlement as sort of quasi science fiction, which it wasn't, but they, you know, they were kind of, I don't know, sn snooty. They had their noses turned up at that stuff. So it sort of did affect his career in a way. He did put his career on the line. And I think um, because of those things, he's kind of underrated. And I think people need to see who he was as a person because um, that uh, he's somebody I really admire just because he just didn't stop. <laughs> he just did not quit. Very good. So let me get a few questions that came in uh, just now. And uh, one, uh, I think it was Joseph is asking, and maybe uh, I haven't read the book in a while, but... Uh, did O'Neill address the, the issues of radiation in terms of space settlements in the book? You know, um, let me see. <laughs> I need to look up specifically. And we could probably get some answers because there's another specific question about radiation protection. So I can probably, we're gonna collect these questions and try to get those answered by some of our other NSS uh, yeah. experts. Probably, you know, it's, it's, I know it's talked a lot about today and, uh, but I, you know, it's, it was, it's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Yeah, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that might be a better question for uh, someone else to answer. Oh, we'll see honestly. if we can get it done. Yep. Uh, someone actually just brought up an interesting, uh, I guess it's uh, what, you know, the, the fact that he went into obscurity uh, and he's not really well known, but someone, uh, Morris indicated that he cited in almost 400 different books uh, about these topics. And so, mm -hmm. so obviously that, you know, as you said, he's much more well known today than maybe than recently. Uh, yeah. Can you explain a little bit about how maybe the scientific, scientific community has actually grabbed onto him? I think um, I just, uh, I think, I think in the last couple of years, he's just undergone, I don't know about the scientific community. I don't know if I can answer this question well, but um, I think in the last couple of years, um, he's kind of undergone a renaissance. I do think the, I do think the science community has more of a respect for him now than they probably did back then. I think back in, during his time, which is kind of sad during his era, you know, like I said, there was kind of people in this, science community sort of looked down at somebody you know doing what they viewed as quasi science fiction stuff and that's how a lot of people in the scientific community viewed space settlement they thought he was they thought he was kind of nuts you know to go into this and um, even though it was very well thought out his designs were practical you know I mean these were things that were um, doable he wasn't you know he wasn't trying to just say you know yeah, we can go to space and we can all eat together from the same, you know, he wasn't just making stuff up. So he was really trying to like work out the actual problems. And um, so, yeah, I think he's more respected now than he was back then, just because I think back in the 60s and probably 70s, there was a bit of a snootiness about, you know, scientists, uh, scientists, scientists trying to like appeal to, um, a mass audience, I guess, if that makes sense. I think there was a little bit of snotty sort of this, I don't know, I don't know what to call it, sort of a classism in the, you know, science community. Sure. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I honestly don't know much about Carl Sagan. I'm sure he probably encountered the same stuff because he was famous, but he was a working scientist as well, you know, but we know him as the guy on TV. Absolutely. Uh, we got a message in the chat from uh, our NSS colleague, Mark Hopkins, who did say that O'Neill did talk about radiation, and uh, he used that in his determination of the thickness of the O'Neill cylinders. So, so it's certainly something he addressed, and so maybe we can get a few other answers about that. Great. Excellent. Yep. 
Uh, yeah, just touching I, on what you what you just earlier said about the, you know the getting the mass of people. Uh, Morris had a follow up question here, and he said, uh, "Why was O'Neill's work so important? Uh, wasn't it because he looked at the whole problem of moving civilization into space, did the math, found ways to solve every problem, and laid the foundation for city sized self sustaining habitats?" And I think you, you've kind of touched on that. Gosh, that's a big question. Um, he did try to work out, um, he did, he was trying to think about uh, addressing all types of problems. Um, a big thing that O'Neill, I don't know if this is answering the question or not, I'll try to do the best I can. Uh, O'Neill really thought um, that, uh, and this is addressed in the High Frontier movie that just came out, O'Neill really believed that a lack of resources is what caused wars um, between like countries because people would fight over you know, oil or people would fight over something that they, you know, one country needed it and one country didn't have it. And that's kind of what his belief system was. Um, so O'Neill was sort of looking at a way, it sounds very utopian now, but he was sort of looking at a way that we could sort of have resources and have sort of self-sustaining, okay, we have sunlight, we have a way of powering things, you know, we have you know, nature, we have all these things that we need. He was sort of looking at a way of sustaining it in another place where we didn't have to really use something expendable on earth. Like, you know, as bad as it sounds, oil and coal, they're, you know, they're, they're not going to last forever. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're gonna, they're not bottomless, you know, they're going to go away eventually, maybe not in our lifetime, but in somebody's lifetime, you know, and um, nuclear power is also a, a source of power, but that has issues, you know, and, um, you know, and so he was kind of looking at, you know, okay, can we use things that are maybe, you know, more unlimited that are, you know, and maybe a bit safer, like such as solar power, you know, things like that. So he was trying to consider, um, he was trying to consider a lot of those variables. Um, he really, he, and he was kind of an environmentalist as well. Um, I think that also bears mentioning and a, a lot of his ideas sort of have this, you know, if you look inside, um, like I said, if you look inside the cylinders, you know, there's a lot of beautiful, you know, textures and landscapes and stuff like that. Um, he was sort of interested in, you know, conservation and he was aware that, you know, if we, we were deforesting and stuff like that, he was aware that that was a terrible trend. So those were things that he was he was kind of trying to address during that time. Uh, and also, um, this is something maybe more controversial because it's more political, but um, he was also worried about um, the threat back then in the 70s, uh, the Cold War between us and the Soviets was still going on. So both of both sides had nuclear weapons. You know, if somebody made somebody mad, we could just throw a bomb at him, you know, and um, he was really concerned about that. So that was another concern he had was, okay, we could all kill ourselves at any time now. You know, maybe we need to do something about it. Very good. Uh, we're getting close to time. One more question that was submitted and then I, I, I did see one hand raised. So he might, uh, we'll do that. But uh, after examining his, you know, his life and his work, is there one thing about him that you didn't know that surprised you? Yeah, um, I did not know he like he um, he actually liked like sort of ragtime music, like piano music. Um, he liked um, he liked Gilbert and Sullivan and stuff like that. I don't know why that tickled the heck out of me. Um, I just thought that was hilarious, uh, not hilarious in a bad way, but I just thought that was adorable for some reason. Uh, he really, um, yeah, he was a, I, I knew he was a private pilot, but I didn't know he was a glider pilot, which I, I think is pretty amazing. Um, yeah, he, he was sort of a, a jack of all trades. Uh, I'm, I'm honestly kind of surprised that he didn't make the 1967 astronaut class, that he was, he was a finalist, which is pretty good. You know, finalist is good, but um, I'm surprised he didn't make the cut because he's kind of like a story Musgrave in the sense that he did, I mean, he did, he was a physicist, he was a pilot, you know, he was this amazing writer. I mean, he was kind of a jack of all trades type person, but I think that's what NASA was looking for at the time. Because if you look at that class, when you have somebody like Phil Chapman, who was a, 
an Antarctic, you know, a pioneer. You know, I think they were looking for people like that. So I'm a little mm. surprised that he didn't make the final cut. Um, I don't know. I, 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 the little sort of note things about the kind of music he liked and the kind of, you know, um, just little, you know, that he was a glider pilot. I just think those things are fascinating to learn. Very good. Thank you so much. I think we'll have one question that was, uh, uh, Larry Ahern has a question I believe he'd like to ask. Larry, do you want to go off mute? Yeah, I'm off mute, I think, am I? Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not really a question. By the way, it's, 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 you, you've never seen Jerry do uh, one of his, uh, I think it's the Pirates of Penzance take off. That's, it was, it's hilarious. It's, uh, but the thing is, I used to, I used to, I wanted to invest in Geostar myself, and I ended up, uh, end up, he sent me a giant box, so I ended up uh, promoting it because I couldn't afford uh, the, the buy-in fee. And I tell you right now, we're 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 trying near the end, about 1990, like this. We're trying to tell uh, Jerry that the uh, location things. What turns out, we have what they call lojack nowadays. We're trying to sell this idea to Jerry, but Jerry was real sick. But, yeah. You know, I, thanks. Yep. Thanks, Larry, for That's sharing awesome. that. That's Thank idea. you. So many interesting connections. Uh, well, very good. I, I think with that, uh, we're going to close out. So I just want to really thank Emily for joining us this evening. Emily, it was, it was a great presentation. We learned a lot. Uh, and uh, I did see one of the comments came in that said we should invite you back to talk about the history of the L5 Society. So, so if you're interested sometime, we can do that. But uh, we really appreciate all the great research you've done uh, and uh, all they're doing to support uh, the National Space Society. Uh, I know we've got a few people who are still on. If you'd like to, I know we didn't talk about space hipsters. But if you'd like to, in the chat, just mention if you're a member of Space Hipsters, feel free to do that. So Emily can see how many are, are there. Uh, and again, thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. We really appreciate it. No problem. This was awesome. Collaboration with you. And I apologize for saying libation point. I was a little nervous. So I'm a little embarrassed because of that. Uh, so if you guys are going to a libation point tonight, <laughs> after this, enjoy yourselves. Very good. Thank you so much again. And as always, I want to thank uh, my colleague, Larry Ahern, who helps uh, jointly organize these space forums and town halls. And of course, our technical expert, Fred Becker, who makes sure that these things are produced. And I want to thank Aggie and Rod for giving us a brief overview, an introduction to the virtual ISDC, which is happening pretty soon. And we are inviting them back in two weeks. Uh, to take a little deeper dive and make sure that everyone uh, can attend the, the ISDC. So uh, what I'm going to do right now is just really quick share my screen again uh, and just get wishing everybody a, uh, a great night. Uh, there we go. Uh, just going to advance the slide here. So again, I want to thank everybody for attending this evening. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, wishing you a, a great evening. For those in tomorrow's time zone, wishing you a great day ahead. And of course, have a really great weekend. So again, thank you all. We'll see you in two weeks uh, to hear a lot more about the ISDC and the membership town hall. Thank you all. Have a great evening.